Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. So despite rumors of the channel not doing Realms Remembered anymore, I, I still am doing that. Uh, I've just been pretty busy with the whole recovering from the back injury thing. It was easy to get in a ton of reading and get in recording and editing at the first, uh, and then as I started to transition back to doing more work and things like that, uh, everything's become kind of difficult. Also, I started another podcast, this one, a review of horror novels out there today, so I'm going to link that down below. Be sure to check it out if you're curious, right? I'm having a decent amount of fun with that. I, I, my heart's still with the realms in a lot of ways. I've been playing Baldur's Gate, the Enhanced Edition, recently. It's got this story mode you can set it on, so if you, like me, are terrible at second edition, <laughs> managing it. Like, I play Neverwinter Nights and I have no problem, but Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, every time I try to play them, it's just like, okay, can I make it through this screen alive? And the answer is always no, unless I save, replay, save, replay, save, replay. I think the main thing is, I'm just no good at managing spellcasters. I never have been as a DM or as a player, and so second edition very big on spellcasters, I think. In any case, we have a lot of books to get through today, so let's go ahead and start on that. A nice thing is that um, there's a new site called All Timelines that has a timeline for damn near every book in Forgotten Realms. They had a few uh, that, like me, they could not figure out a year for, or I guess like Olaf, because I always just relied on that, unless the book, like Richard Lee Byers was always great at that, like this takes place in this month on this day of this year. There you go, done. So very easy to figure those out. But uh, for me, I relied on Olub, and then Olub didn't do 4th edition, but these guys do everything. And I think the only one that we have left that they categorize as unknown is Gilded Rune. And I'll just put that before the 5th edition transition, because that seems to make the most sense. So some of this is way out of order now, and again, I'll, I'll link that down below so you can check it out for yourself. See if you disagree with anything, let them know, not me, obviously. But because we have that, now I have kind of a, a path set up to move forward. And I, I'll be honest, I don't know, this might just be like a couple more episodes, because I have a hell of a lot to get through here. Let's start out, let's close out a couple of trilogies. Cry of the Ghost Wolf by Mark Sehested. I was really excited to get to part three of this because I really liked part one, and then part two just felt like this kind of necessary but uneventful transition, and I just could not get into it at all. It was like, instead of taking back the land and finding out what it means to be the Hand of Nawandan, it's like hobgoblin politics for like a third of the book, and I just, by that point, I was like, man, I just don't care anymore. I just could not get into it. I think it had also been long enough that I had kind of forgotten a lot of the characters, <laughs> and so uh, things would be mentioned, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what you're even talking about, dude. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, I really liked book one, but book one was so far in the past, or at least I felt like it had a lot of promise. Maybe I go back and listen to the review, and it's like, oh, this sucks, but I know I made it through book one, um, and book two... Like, I skipped a lot of it, but I enjoyed the parts that I did read. The parts that I felt were the meat of the book. It didn't do much for me, and that's really frustrating, because Sahasted, I think, has a lot of potential. I wish uh, that I had seen more from him in the realms. Uh, he's somebody I'll definitely check out and see what else they're writing. Avenger finishing out Blades of the Moon Sea. I think I said that the last one, the Corsair, I think I thought that it was the finale, because... I skipped so much of it that I was like, oh, I guess it just ended, but sadly, Avenger, same thing. I just didn't get into it, nothing appealed to me. It's so frustrating because I really thought the first, like, hundred or so pages of Sword Mage was some of Baker's best stuff, so atmospheric, and so it just pulled you in, and at, by this point, I just couldn't give a damn less about anything. Very frustrating, I feel very frustrated with a lot of the realms at this point. I feel like, you know, so so I still owe you guys my defense of 4th edition, and I will do that probably next episode when we finish out 4th edition. Maybe I'll get 
hooked on a couple of the books and we'll have two more episodes of 4th edition. But we'll figure out a way. I'll do it. I'll do my defense of it. But I really feel like Wizards themselves didn't understand what 4th edition was good at and marketed it terribly. And I feel like the same thing is happening with the books. And I'll get into that a little bit more when I get to the last uh, couple of books here. But first I want to mention The Edge of Chaos by Jack Koch uh, from The Wilds. I was excited about this because it's about the Plague Rot lands, and I'm pretty sure that we got a little taste of those in the Bruce Cordell Abolethic Sovereignty trilogy, and I thought it would be exciting to get more. But the setting itself was kind of interesting, but nothing pulled me into it. Nothing made me want to keep reading. I just remember the beginning, and there were like three characters, and I was like, I don't give a damn about any of these guys. So, meh, I didn't get very far in it. I'm sure you're sensing a pattern here, right? Last two books that I want to talk about, maybe with a little bit more depth to them, are Brimstone Angels, Lesser Evils by Aaron Evans, and Spider and Stone by Julie Johnson. Lesser Evils, sadly, I really didn't like overall, but I, I read most of it. I got, I, I got through most of it. I just kind of skimmed uh, towards the end because I was like, I can't keep all the damn characters straight, and I'm not really giving a damn about any of this. So the first, Brimstone Angels, which I loved, 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 was mostly set in Neverwinter. This one, they're in Waterdeep on their way to Cormyr. And this is like how in the Shadowbane books, in the first one he's in Waterdeep, and in the second one he's in that uh, town doing the western gig, and I, I can't remember the name of that town, but also in Spider and Stone, it's characters from a different book who go to a new location. And it seems as if in the books, much like in the supplements that they put out for 4th edition, Wizard seems to think that 4th edition is all about visiting set pieces and interacting with the set pieces. And this has to be a little difficult to manage as a writer in the fiction realm. It sort of makes sense on the supplement side, but in the fiction side, Unless you're doing a kind of Hercules, the Legendary Journeys, or Xena, uh, what the hell is her subtitle? I can't remember. Warrior Princess, maybe? Unless you're doing a thing like that where it's about wandering people. And I guess with adventuring parties, that can work. But, like, for instance, Downshadow seemed so much about Waterdeep, and specifically the first couple of levels of Undermountain. Like, that was his his area, you know, I mean, he was meant to be this Batman-esque character. Can you imagine, like, if Batman first appeared in a novel and then the people who owned the property were like, okay, but now he can't be in Gotham for the second book. He's got to wander. It's like, it just, I mean, there was a reason in the sequel that he wasn't in Waterdeep anymore, but it just felt weird. It was like, I don't want to learn about a new place with this character. I want to see how he interacts here some more. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure if it were done in a way that made me happier, I would have been okay with it, but I felt as if the authors were maybe chafing at it a bit. So in any case, Lesser Evils uh, uh, just had a lot of frustrations with it. You know, I think I mentioned in the first book that I was frustrated that their Dragonborn, like, father figure is under a spell for most of the book, so we don't really get much with him, and I was excited to see him in the second book. Second book, he just immediately disappears from the scene because they don't have enough money to teleport to Cormir, and it's going to cost just as much if they go overland. So the idea is he's going to take the prisoner, teleport to Cormir for just the price of two people, then get their bounty, and then he'll just quickly come back and get them, and they can all do their thing. He disappears and then just isn't there for the rest of the book, and they don't know why, so they have to kind of fend for themselves in Waterdeep. And this seems like it would be a perfectly acceptable plot, and there were some things that I liked. Faraday is kind of courted by this mysterious suitor, and that's interesting. It could have gone somewhere. She's looking for a spell book and things like that to save. I cannot remember his name for the life of me right now, but that demon guy who she made the pact with. All of these things seem like they could be interesting, but they all just drag on for the entire book. And by the time that anything has any sort of resolution, I just didn't care anymore. So I'm hoping that it's maybe just kind of a sophomore slump. I'm pretty sure this is not Aaron's second novel uh, total, 
but still it's the second in the series, and so I'm hoping maybe it was just kind of a sophomore slump, plus the whole, like, having to move them to a completely different location, I don't think that was the plan. It, it didn't feel like it. Maybe it was, but it didn't feel like that was the plan, and it felt like, oh, I gotta throw some things in here to liven it up. Uh, the problem is... E e if you don't have a full novel of a story, you can't just throw other things in to kind of pad it, because then it just makes it more confusing and disjointed and unfocused. Not a horrible novel, but nowhere near as engaging as the first one, and I'm still looking forward to the next one. The last book that I want to talk about today is Spider and Stone from Jalee Johnson, and this is part of The Rise of the Underdark which, it's weird, the Rise of the Underdark stuff seemed to be, like, years apart. Like, there seemed, and there's no, there's nothing pulling them together except they involve the Underdark somewhat. So, here's the thing. This is a sequel to a book I didn't like. It's about drow versus dwarves, neither of which I find very interesting in the realms. And I love this book. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I, I can't tell you why. I know one of the things that really excited me about it, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but it comes at the end. So, like, obviously I liked the book enough to be into it and engaged through the whole thing that I found this out. I remember reading at some point about a plot that they were going to do in a Realms novel and possibly a Realms, like, event that was based around one of the magicians in... Menza Bronzen or one of the Underdark cities figures out a spell to permanently change a person's gender. In a matriarchy, this is a huge deal, right? I mean, like, think about that. How much more power, like a Grom for a Rild or whatever, would be able to hold if they were a female. So I thought this was a fascinating idea and, like, crazy and a terrible genie that you could never put back in the bottle. <laughs> But I was really excited to see how they handled it. That novel just kind of disappeared, or that idea just kind of disappeared. And I think it must have been that either I misunderstood uh, some copy for this book, or the idea for this book changed at some point. Because we have a male character in this book who realizes that parts of his memory are missing and eventually we find out that it's because he was a woman in the drow city and he had his gender changed and some of his memories removed. I think this is an awesome book for that reason and many others. I'm really kind of shocked that I didn't enjoy the first novel in this series. Like, it just felt like it never got off the ground enough to pull me into it, but the characters really popped here. I'm trying to remember their names. I know Iceland is the uh, girl of the party, but there's like a cook who I think might just be called Cook. All he does is talk about recipes and shit. Like, he's just a cook. Like, that's really cool to have in an adventuring party. And anyway, Iceland is like, got the hots for the guy in their party who's, you know, the, like, his touch is death, and he's all emo and goth and everything, but he's still enjoyable, I think. And there's a really abrupt marriage scene towards the end, but I don't I don't know if Jalee was like, I don't think I'm going to get a sequel, especially out of this gender-bending horse shit, so I better just wrap it up really quickly. But yeah, that was weird and sudden, but still I was like, okay. Um, and, and then the, the, like, mystery behind the dwarven king who they're helping, once you find that out, I found it pretty fascinating. And there are these Bits in there where I'm like, man, I do not know what the hell is going on here. Somebody, like, involved in, like, planar theory is going to have to take a look at this and explain it to me. But I did notice that a lot of people had highlighted that section, so probably I was right to think it's important. Oh, hey, in fact, I highlighted it as well because I was intrigued by it. So if you don't want a massive spoiler... Maybe turn away now, because basically this review is done. But here's what I highlighted, and this is Iceland, like, seeing through the dwarf's eyes, who's really a dragon, and he had a curse put on him because he kind of saw too much in the Astral Sea. There's a scar in the Astral Sea. Roiling within the scar was a five-headed beast, its serpentine necks braided together in shades of red, black, green, white, and blue. 
I assume that's Tiamat, but I don't know what that means. I, I It's like, is, is Tiamat not supposed to be there? I don't know where Tiamat hangs out. I thought it was interesting, and I felt like it's probably a big secret, and I wonder what other big secrets that I've totally been missing are hiding out in these books. Who knows? <laughs> because I looked up that note, I also searched my Kindle to see if uh, Lesser Evils had any notes in it, and it did. I highlighted this one segment to showcase how ridiculous the slang is getting in 4th edition. This is Havilar, who generally, I thought, had amazing dialogue in the first book. She says, Gods, it's like you're packed as a lodestone for shady, codloose winkers. Like, I just, I can't read that with a straight face. I'm sorry. It's so friggin' ridiculous. Yeah, we're just breezing through stuff here, as you can tell. Just uh, uh, not really engaging with much, and that frustrates me, and that's why I haven't recorded this for a while, and that's why I haven't been excited to read more in a while. But I am going to try to just go ahead and get through this in the next couple of months at least, because why not? We are so close to the end now. Coming up next, I'm going to start out at least with Elminster and Rage. Going to give it a shot, right? Why not? And uh, Sandstorm? Probably go beyond that, and I'll leave the list at the bottom here. Until next time, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.